I'm Eve Puffer. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Duke Global Health Institute. So I have a two-year fellowship and I'm working in Kenya on HIV prevention strategies and mental health for youth. So I'm really studying the factors that place youth, youth at risk for HIV risk behaviors and also that place them at risk for mental health problems. For youth, what we've often been doing is taking an approach of teaching youth either in schools or um, by themselves about healthy behavior decisions and how HIV is transmitted. But the results are really showing that we need to take a broader approach. So the newer research and, and what I'm trying to do is to look at the ways that families, culture, religion really is, are influencing the youth's behavior decisions and how we can interact with those systems, not just with the youth themselves, to help them change their behaviors. The prevalence in Kenya overall is around 7%, and in the province where we're working in Nyanza, it's about 15.3% from the latest numbers. However, because Mahuru Bay is right on Lake Victoria, there's a lot more movement in and out of the community. And so the HIV prevalence along those lake regions is higher. The local estimates are between 30 and 40 percent prevalence of HIV, um, though the source of that data is a little unclear. What we do know is that it's higher than Kenya and higher than Nyanza as a whole. So you're talking to up to a third of people you know, living um, HIV positive. We did in-depth interviews with youth and their caregivers, and we also held focus groups. The focus groups really let us get access to other, other sectors of the community. So we had focus groups for fishermen. We had focus groups for community leaders and for pastors so that we could hear their ideas, especially about how the cultural practices, the economic situation, and the fishing industry, as well as the religious you know, the strong religious faith of the community all interact and maybe um, send messages to youth about sexual behavior. The whole community is definitely touched by uh, the fishing industry. So you have the fishermen who are catching the fish and then you have women who often buy those fish from the fishermen and sell them in the marketplace. When women and men are sort of negotiating who is going to get the fish and who's going to sell the fish, sex often plays a part in that. So, for instance, women may have sex with the fishermen as a way to establish themselves as the woman who is going to continually buy fish from this man. So they sort of solidify that relationship through sex. For the young, young people, sometimes the boys have pocket money and the girls also you know, need or want some of that money and so they may strike up you know, what they call a friendship or um, a relationship where sex is an expected part of the relationship and it's also the way the girls get access to the money that the boys, that the boys have. When you ask youth directly, they know that HIV has really hit their community. They know that half of their friends are orphans because their parents, one or both of their parents, have, have died of AIDS. They also have a lot of the basic knowledge we want them to have about how HIV is transmitted. The problem is in translating that knowledge and the awareness of the problem into behavior change. What we found is that a lot of youth seem to be getting some mixed messages about um, their sexual behavior. Um, in, on one hand, they're told to stay abstinent until marriage, but many of them are in situations where sexual behavior is actually expected. For instance, for boys, um, often families associate sexual behavior maybe with energy or um, especially eating a lot of fish from the lake. They connect having a lot of that protein with a stronger sexual urge. So beliefs like that end up encouraging some of the young people to have sex. Children who reported higher levels of emotional symptoms were more likely to be sexually active. Surprisingly, this seemed to be a little bit more true for the boys 
um, than, than for the girls. For transactional sex that I mentioned before, where girls are often asking for money um, in return for sex or being offered money or goods for sex, um, we really found a strong relationship between the number of traumatic experiences that they have had and their likelihood to engage in this behavior. So if they had had more trauma in their lives, and many of these children had, um, that seemed related to whether or not they engaged in transactional sex. There could be several reasons for that that our data don't clearly show. Um, but it could be that these traumas are really representing a harder life for many reasons that these girls have had that's really put them in situations where they need um, to exchange sex for money. We hope to take the results that we found and develop an intervention that involves multiple sectors of the community to come together and support youth to make healthier decisions about their sexual behavior specifically. We also want an intervention that will improve the mental health or prevent mental health problems among these youth and families. Because we've started to see this relationship of parent-adolescent communication and HIV risk, we hope to develop a component of the intervention that really supports families in learning how to problem solve together and how to communicate about issues of HIV and sex. Another way we hope to use these findings is to engage the church more actively in HIV prevention because the church and faith are so central to life in Mahuru Bay. So we think that the church is an organization that is really well positioned to support youth and their families as a unit because it's a place that they go together, it's a place that they naturally find support. Um, and we've seen that many of the youth are using religiously focused coping mechanisms to already deal with some of the challenges they have emotionally and financially. I am planning to go back in January to start talking with the community and a committee of leaders that we've identified to help develop the content of the intervention. This spring or summer I then hope to go back and do a larger scale pilot where we can really um, select some areas of the community to receive the intervention and test out whether or not this is a feasible and acceptable way for the community to address this problem whether we can identify people who we can train to deliver the intervention to their own fellow community members, and what the possibilities are for future funding to sustain the program, really, over a longer period of time if it's found to be effective.